Today, we have with us a very special guest, uh, Brother Don Smith from over at the YouTube channel, Only One Truth. And Brother, you've been a tremendous blessing to me. Uh, you know, I've been watching your stuff for quite a while, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, at first, when I first started listening to you, it was a very tough message to accept. Uh, you, you preach the straight and narrow, for sure, probably more so than uh, most holiness preachers on YouTube today. And, and it's a difficult message. It, it just is. Um, you know, it, it just reminds me of in Revelation, John talks about how he was given this scroll to eat. And at first it tasted like honey. It was very sweet on his mouth. Mm -hmm. But then as he digested it, as it went down, it became very bitter. And then he was told to go and proclaim this to the nation. So um, it, it was, it's a very difficult message. It is. Um, but mostly because it's our flesh that wants to hold on, right? That's that's the only reason it's difficult. If if we could just abandon everything, uh, then it wouldn't be it wouldn't be difficult. But it's that flesh that you know trying to hold on to that uh, that it becomes difficult. But yeah, it, I mean, it was very it was very tough to digest your messages. But I'm so grateful now. I realized that you were just preaching the the truth, and I knew it at the time. I knew I knew you were just preaching the truth. I knew that what you were saying just simply comes from scripture. Um, there's some tough things in scripture, mm. right? We, we all are familiar mm. with the verses like John three sixteen. That's, that's like the sweet thing that, that we hear at first, the, the easy, you know, John mm -hmm. three sixteen, Ephesians two, eight, nine. And we think, wow, you know, this is great until we start to hear the conditions that are attached to, um, to serving Christ and how we're supposed to please our master and work out our salvation with fear and trembling and all these other things that we're supposed to do. Um, and, and not only that, but just knowing friends and family around us who aren't doing that, who aren't living this thing out, mm, um, it, yes. it's, it's tough. It becomes very mm -hmm. tough. And that's why I think that, uh, that there's, that there's going to be some resistance. But those who have ears to hear will know that you're, you're preaching the truth. You're preaching just what Scripture says. Uh, even though it's difficult, they will accept it um, if they're abiding in Christ. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. It's a blessing to be here, Brother Adam. I've watched you also on your channel, and I'm so blessed. I look forward every time I see you come out with a new one. Uh, you did some really great videos of touching people. And that, that's just, you have the same passion, I think, as I do, and that is a love for the people. Uh, we have the message that uh, of repentance to, a, to an hour that we're living in in these last days. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 4, 1, he says that in the last days, there would be a, many seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And we see that is very prevalent today. And I wanna be able to help the people. You know, if you see someone and, and they might be in that house, in a house that's burning and it's on fire, uh, you're gonna go out, you're gonna go in there and you're gonna do whatever you can to get them out of it. I wanna help people to come out of what's being, of what's happening today, the hindrance that's keeping them from coming into a perfect peace, a perfect place in the Lord, ready to meet Jesus. And we have an urgent hour. We don't have long. I really believe that with all my heart. We live in the last days. We don't have long. It's urgent on my heart. Um, I'm a, a lot older than I used to be. I'm almost 70 years old. I pastor a church here in uh, Louisiana, and uh, we have people come in from all over the world that have been coming in and uh, this, uh, it's just exciting what God is, is doing. I'm excited about it, but I wanna see more. Mm -hmm. I wanna see many people come to know the Lord in a real way. I wanna see people get freed. You know, Jesus said in John chapter eight, in whom the son sets free, he is free indeed. Uh, John eight thirty four says, as a matter of fact, he says uh, that, that he that sins is a servant to sin. He's a slave to it. I don't wanna see people be slaves to sin. I want to see him be free and enjoy the peace and the joy and be pleasing to the Lord. If you're in love with Jesus Christ, like I, like I am and like you are, then all you want to do, my joy is pleasing him. And so we want to help you today to be able to see those things that are pleasing to, to the Lord. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Why are you saying you're a Christian? and you're not doing what he said to do. Uh, and Amen. we want to look at probably some of those things that he says to do and ask you the question, a very important question, because it got asked to me and it woke me up. Why aren't you doing what Jesus said to do? Don't be yeah. talked out of that. 
He is the one that has, has all authority and power who is given to him to, from the Father. Why aren't you listening to Jesus and doing those things that he says? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, praise God. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, just kind of introduce yourself. I know that you were a former Mr. America and you were a professional bodybuilder. Uh, you started up your own very successful clothing company. Um, and now I, I believe you've t- kind of taken a little bit of a step back from that. Now you're just a, a servant and a slave of Jesus. So uh, you you told me yesterday we were talking and, and you're like, you know, um, you, you were talking about how you don't have long left on this world because, you know, um, I mean, the time is short. The time is short. And your your heart, like you were saying, your heart is just to see people come to Jesus. And, and that's what it's all about, furthering the kingdom, uh, furthering the gospel. So. Uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself and then also tell us about how you came out of the of the false message that's being preached in, in most churches today. Well, well, Adam uh, and so many of you, I'd like to tell you, I wasted so much of my life. I'm nearly 70, like I said. I feel like I don't have long, even if um, even if the, the time of the coming of the Lord is uh, is somewhat delayed. But I don't think that it is. I think I will be here. Nevertheless, I wasted a lot of time in the life that I have, I have now left. I want to live with all of my heart for Jesus. I, my, my, I found in life that my happiest place in life is when I know that I'm pleasing God. So I'm walking in that constantly now. So I'm like, I feel like I'm the happiest guy in the world. But it wasn't always like that. Uh, I wasted a lot of time fulfilling the desires of my flesh, doing what I thought would make me happy. Uh, the scripture talks about that, uh, that what, what's highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. Well, what's highly esteemed among men? Success of this world. And that's exactly what I went after. The Lord started dealing with me a long time ago. I was just 19 years old. It was 50 years ago. And I, and I, I remember being at some people's house I was running a, a health club then, and I, I, I was reading the, the book of First John. Can you believe that, Adam? The book of First John is the book that tells you in First John 4, he says, I've written these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. So I highly recommend that, the book. And that was the first book I started reading. I started reading that book, and I was sitting there with a group of Baptist people. I had just come out of Catholicism. I didn't know anything about anything in the Bible. I'd never read it. It just sat on our our end table at my Catholic home, and I wasn't allowed to read it. I just started reading this Bible, and I was just man, wow, look at what he's saying. Look what I get to read what Jesus is saying now. And I was reading that, and I remember reading 1 John 2, 4, and it says, the one that says, I know him, but does not obey his commandments, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. And man, I looked at that, and I was like, guys, you see this? We're not supposed to be sinning, because if we're breaking his commandments, and we're saying we're a Christian, we're lying. And they said, oh, no, it, that's not what it really says. And it, it's kind of like the parable of the sower, you, you know, Adam, when, when he talks about how the, the seed was planted and the first seed that went forth fell among the wayside and the fowls of the air ate it up, which indicated, as he, as he interpreted it, he said that that's the devil that comes to take that seed away. And right away, when I began to say, and tell them this. They they got the pastor on the phone. They got they began to come at me. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything of the Bible. I'm just reading it like it says. And I got led back into the wrong direction, unfortunately. But I never forgot that. And it always did bother me. And later on, you know, I you know got involved in another another group that believed in, in living without sin, really, but I got offended. I fell into the next problem. I didn't have any root in myself. I fell away. And I started going after the world and started trying to find happiness. Because let me tell you something. If you've got something inside of you that you still want and you vehemently want that and thinking that's going to make you happy. We've gone through that in our lives many times when we growing up. We think, well, if I just when I finish school, I just want to finish school. Then I'll be happy when I get my first bicycle. I'll be happy when I get my first job. I'll be happy. When I graduate from college, I'll be happy. When I get my car, and it keeps going on and on. Well, mine was I wanted to be um, a bodybuilder. I wanted to win Mr. America. And so I started training really, really hard and um, wasting a lot of time in the Lord, wasting a lot of my life away, 
hurriedly going through it, trying to do that. It took a lot of effort. Wow, if anyone put that kind of effort in and stopped sending, it'd be really great. But it, it was a lot of pain, a lot of a lot of heartache, a lot of time. And I finally won. And I remember I was in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I was on that stage after I'd, after I'd been awarded the Mr. America. And I said, I begin to think, is this all there is to it? All that for this? And so then I, I moved to California after I'd lived in Louisiana. I moved out to California. And I uh, I started uh, making clothing. I had won America, so it helped me get into door do that. I started making active wear. And it did really, really well. It was the baggies era back in the 80s. And uh, it wasn't long I became a multimillionaire and because I was going for the money then. I'd been try, tried the fame, then I tried the money, and I was a multimillionaire. And I remember being so miserable, even with that. Yeah, there were ecstasies of happiness, but it never lasted. And I remember uh, um, my wife and I, because uh, I chased the women too, and I'd married a woman that was not in the Lord and we were having so much trouble and I was just broken. And so I, I pulled up in the Mercedes place. I bought the most expensive Mercedes. I had a six, uh, 600 SL, $135,000 cash. I drove out. I'm like, I'm still miserable. And you know, you wonder why do these movie stars commit suicide? Well, I know why, you know, some people chase that carrot and never get it. I chased the carrot and I got it. And I realized it was nothing there. So mm -hmm. there I was, I had, I had succeeded and, and it didn't bring any happiness. I was empty. Well, time went on, chasing it, chasing it. And it finally came to a place where I, I want to find the true happiness. I, I know there's got to be something there. There's got to be more than what I've experienced in the past. There's got to be a, a great life ahead. He promises it in the scripture. He promises a peace that it passes all understanding he promises the joy that no man can take away i've got to find that treasure and i remember I, I used to always quote this scripture it was in matthew chapter 13 that says the kingdom of heaven is like a a merchant seeking goodly pearls and that's what i was i was seeking trying to find that goodly pearl but when he finds that <clears throat> one of great price he goes and sells all that he has lets it all go Praise God. That one pearl. He, he seeks after it. He's seeking for it. I was seeking for the precious pearl. I didn't know it. I was trying to find these other, and I had all these other pearls. And I'm like, forget all that. I just want the best. And that was Jesus. And so I forsook all that. I, I denounced all the bodybuilding. Listen, if you're bodybuilding, if you're doing all that stuff, trying to find that happen, you're going after them. And I did it. It's not going to give you what you think. It, will, it won't, certainly won't give you eternal life. You'll end up in hell. And it's only going to give you ecstasy for a little bit of time, a little bit of happiness. And then you're going to hit the down. And then what are you going to do? Thank God. I was ready. I remember waking up in the morning. Man, I just wanted to, I just wanted to die when I was going through that. But then when I found a pearl of great price, I said, now all I want to do, forget everything else. Forget every agenda of what any kind of goal, anything I... I I'm not interested in that. That's gone from me. My whole wow. desire to the Lord is to please the Lord. My whole desire is to do the work of the Lord and hear his voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger's voice they won't follow. He has a wonderful, beautiful voice, Brother Adam. I, I yes. love to, to hear him when he speaks to me. He's beautiful. He's wonderful. Uh, I just love him and just so in love with him. With him. Praise but let God. me tell you. Let me tell you, I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was mm -hmm. lost, but now I'm found. You thinking, well, there's got to be more. Yes, you're right. There is more. But that more is only found in Jesus. He said, I am the way. I'm the truth and the life in John 14, 6. You're not going to find life outside of Jesus. You're searching for it. You're searching for it. Oh, I wish that people that the Lord would be long will, will continue to be long suffering and give you the opportunities I had, but you don't know that. All you have is right now. And you need to forget those other things. Listen, Jesus will give you a joy that no man can take away and that you can't find anywhere else. Praise He's God. The precious pearl. Yeah. Yes. You're you're what a beautiful story. Um that reminds me somewhat of my story about how you you went into the church and, and you were bringing these verses to their attention. And, and that's what I did. I remember being in my small group and I asked something to the effect of, I was reading through Romans and I asked something to the effect of if we're loving our brother with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, because it says Romans that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that love does no evil and it's fulfillment of the law and all this. 
And, and I said, I asked, I said, well, so if we're loving God and we're loving our neighbor with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and, you know, we're loving our neighbors ourselves, um, then, then we won't sin. And, uh, and of course, right away, it was the devil snatched away. Uh, they, they had all sorts of reasons why that's not the case and that sort of thing. But that's, that's what we're talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about this whole notion of how, how people call Christians sinners. And they say things like, Oh, we're all sinners saved by grace, right? I'm sure everybody's heard that. Um, they say things like, oh, you know, we're just a bunch of filthy sinners. Um, and they see this as sort of a sign of humility. This is seen as a sign of humility mm -hmm. in most Christian mm -hmm. circles. You just degrade yourself and put yourself down. Um, and also it's seen as sort of a, a badge of honor. Uh, but is this biblical? Is this really what the Bible says? Well, no. As we're going to go through, we're going to show you some scriptures. This is not what the Bible says. But let me just tell you, First, that this doctrine stems from uh, Martin Luther. He, he came up with this idea, and it could probably be traced back before him, but he came up with this idea, or at least promoted this idea, that you could be considered just or a saint and also a sinner at the same time, even though this isn't what the Bible teaches. There's mm. a couple of passages mm. that we're going to talk about uh, that they twist, and I think it's either First or Second Timothy, and then, of course, Romans 7. Uh, they, they twist these, but this is nowhere found in Scripture. In fact, uh, what we see is the Bible, Bible never calling Christians sinners. It always calls them saints. But um, mm -hmm. first, a lot of people think that to be a saint, uh, especially this is popular among Catholics, that you have to uh, you know, do so many miracles or that you have to be venerated in, in the church, like the Catholic Church or something like that. But no, that's not how the Bible defines saints. Saints are simply uh, Christians. Okay, that's, that's what we are. Um, and again, Paul in his epistles, most of his epistles, he addresses the church as saints. Never once does he say, oh, to the sinners in Ephesus or to the sinners in Colossae. No, it's always to the saints. OK, the, the Bible never calls mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a true born again Christian, Christian a sinner. Um, for example, let's just look at this in Colossians 1, 2. It says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from our God, from, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So did you catch that? He says to the saints and faithful brethren. And some people may say, oh, well, see, he says to the saints and faithful brethren as if they might be two separate categories. Like there's the saints and then there's the faithful. No, what, what Paul is saying here is that the faithful brethren and the saints, they're the same thing. So to the saints and the faithful brethren. Uh, for example, other translations like the CSB, it actually translates it this way. It says to the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters. So that's how it translates it. So we know that a saint is a faithful brother and sister. Uh, and the NLT, mm -hmm. it translates it this way. We are to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. OK, again, he's saying that that saints are considered faithful brethren. Uh, in the NAT, NA, NET, to the saints, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae. Uh, and then the DBY translation translates it this way, to the holy and faithful brethren in Christ. Okay, so that's the first thing mm -hmm. that we need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, saints mm -hmm. are holy, they're faithful. That's the first thing we need to know. Uh, the second thing is, in Revelation 14, 12, we see that saints are those who keep the commandments of God. Uh, it says, yeah. here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. See, it's not only the faith of Jesus, but it's also keeping the commandments of God. This is how the Bible describes saints. It says, mm -hmm. Here are those who keep the commandments of God, the saints. So that's the second thing we need to know. The, the first thing, again, um, was that, that saints are faithful brethren. That's how Paul describes them. And they keep the commandments of God. That's number two. And the third thing is that saints are sanctified. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, it says to the church of God, which is in Corinth, or which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified. So past tense, they have been sanctified. They're not on a, on a journey of progressive sanctification where they're, uh, you know, doing certain sins less and less, and they're going to uh, be freed from their sin when they get their glorified bodies. No, it says past tense are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. So that's mm -hmm. that's how it describes a saint. He says that they saints are sanctified. sanctified. 
Uh, and we see that in this in this passage of 1 Corinthians 1, 2, saint and sanctified are actually from the same word. Uh, saint is, in the Greek, it's uh, hagias. And sanctified is hagiadza. So they're, they're almost the same word. They're just a slight variation. Uh, but that's what it means to be a saint. You're, you're sanctified. You're faithful. You're holy. And you're keeping the commandments mm-hmm. of Jesus. So, uh, I mean, yeah, if you don't mind, beautiful. yeah, um, maybe talk to us about uh, w- what a sinner is. I mean, I, I, this sounds silly that we even have to discuss this, that we even have to discuss what a sinner is. But due to this doctrine that says that you can be a sinner and, and simultaneously a saint at the same time, uh, again, even though the Bible doesn't say this, we have to go through and explain these things. So uh, what wake on it? Yeah, these are some very elementary factors that that uh, really have to be brought out. I mean, you're going back to the basics here and a very, very good explanation, Brother Adam, and very good scriptures that you brought in with that. Uh, but what we know in First John chapter 3 and verse 4, it says that the one that sins transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if, if somebody's a sinner, it's called a sinner, and you're calling yourself a sinner, then that means that you are transgressing the law of God, that you're missing the mark is what the... The definition actually says so you're you're not making it you're 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 a sinner uh james 4 17 says the one who 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 knows to do good and doesn't do it sins so that's a sinner so you're knowing to do good and you're not doing it you're a sinner you're not a saint okay then in romans 14 23 what's not a faith is sin so if you if you can't do something in faith believing that christ is doing it through you you know, like you, if you're doing drugs, if you're fornicating, then, uh, or, or you're uh, maybe even smoking. And you, you must need to ask yourself, is, is this Christ doing this through me? Am I doing this in faith? If not, it is sin, class is a sinner. Um, so uh, all of these things show what a sinner really is. The Bible says in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, it, it says that if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So you've got a, a situation that's asked there. If you're claiming to be a sinner, you're in trouble. Because if you go there to, um, to, the, um, to, what, to what I'm talking about, First Peter chapter 4, you'll see it's a very uh, eye-opening uh, scripture there that uh, is very, very uh, right to the point. He says there, uh, verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. For if, the first, if, if it first began at us, what shall be of the end of them that don't obey the gospel of God? So this is talking about the sinner, the one who is not obedient. He's walking in disobedience. He's not obeying the gospel of, of God. Then he is a sinner. What's going to happen to him? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly, the person that's not living like God, the person that's living for the world, where will that sinner appear? That is a dangerous situation that you're in. If you if you're called, being called a sinner, we are not sinners and saints. Those are two opposing factors that can't be. A saint is is one who is mar, is walking morally blameless, holy, like like Adam said. Whereas hmm. the sinner is doing the opposite. He's not walking holy. He's walking in 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 rebellion to God. He's missing the mark. He's got this, and he needs to wake up because he's in a real bad position. Jesus said in John 8, 21, he said, if you die in your sin, you will not be with him. That's a serious thing. And in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 21, it says this, warn the right righteous that the righteous don't sin. So we're here today to tell you, this is not us saying this. This is not my words or my opinion. Look at it for yourself. Ezekiel three twenty one. Warn the righteous that the righteous don't sin. So if you're saying you're righteous, if you're saying you're a saint and you're sinning, I'm warning you because that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm, that's scripture, brother. Wow. Um, let, let's look at this. Let's look at 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11. Paul tells us exactly who a sinner is. He, he, he describes a sinner. Okay, so if, if you guys are wondering, well, can Christians be sinners? Paul says that the law is given to sinners. Okay, listen to this. Mm-hmm. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate. So a sinner is somebody who's lawless and insubordinate, you know, disobedient. Said, he goes on to say, for the ungodly and for sinners. You see, he equates a sinner 
with somebody who is ungodly, you know, who does ungodly things. Imagine that. And he says, mm -hmm. for the unholy and profane. See, he's, he's lumping them all. They're all, all in the same category. A sinner is somebody who is unholy, profane, ungodly, insubordinate, and lawless. That means they're transgressing the law of God. Uh, and then he goes on and says, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, this is who the law is for, for fornicators mm -hmm. who look with lust and, and have sex outside of marriage, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, mm. which was committed to my trust. Uh, in, in James 5, 19 and 20, he says, brethren, so he's talking to Christians and he says, if anyone among mm -hmm. you, brethren, mm -hmm. wonders from the truth and someone turns it back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So we know that a sinner is somebody who wonders from the truth, either somebody who's never come into the, the sheepfold at all, or a brethren who has wandered from the truth. That's how James describes a sinner. It's somebody who is who was in the truth at one point, who was a brother, but who has wandered from the truth and wandered off into sin, just like the prodigal. Remember, he left his father and wandered off into licentious living, uh, fornication, what, whatever whatever else it may have been. Uh, in Galatians, now look at this one. This, this is probably one of the strongest cases. Listen to this. Paul is addressing Christians in Galatians 2, and he says, but if while we Christians, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Mm, that's good. Sinners. That, that means that we th there's a, there are people that aren't found sinners, right? He says, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Uh, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So he clearly says that if you go off into sin, just like James, if you wander from the truth, go off into sin, then you're making Christ a minister of sin. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. then lastly here, Proverbs eleven thirty one. It says, if the righteous will be recompensed on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner? Do you see that? Same you see thing, how yeah. it, it's Church equating mm -hmm. sinner with the ungodly, just like you said in Peter. Wow, that's so good. You know, when you when you were saying James 5, it just reminded me of this, and I just want to bring this out. If you'll compare James 5, 19 and 20 to Ezekiel 3, 20 and 21, when he starts off, he says, brethren. When you start off in, in chapter 20, he says, when a righteous man, which is the same thing, he's a, it's a brother, uh, does turn from his righteousness, and here this this, this sinner, this brethren, uh, he... he, he, he it, it says that let him know that he that's right that he that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way so he turned to sin he, even though he converted to him he says but he said when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin same thing and i lay a stumbling block before him and he, sh he shall die he will not make it so but because thou has not warned him he shall he shall die in his sin uh, so and his soul shall die sin, it's the same and his soul shall die so that's the same thing that jesus said in 8, john eight twenty one. that says if you die in your sin you will not be with me. So it's, it goes right along with that. And and so here he goes. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless verse 3, 21, if thou warn the righteous man, this is what's happening in James chapter five. He's war He warns the righteous man. He warns that, that brother that the righteous don't sin and, and, he, and he quits sinning. Then you, you know, he shall surely live because he, he warned him also delivered and delivered. So not only that, but the righteous man turns from his righteousness. All of his sin that, that he had done before, uh, all of his righteousness that he done before is no longer remembered, you know. So that all his sin comes back on him. So That's what it says. this is a, some very important points. And what we're trying to do, and I think with Adam here, if we're trying to build a foundation to show you the truth, because in a little while he's going to bring up some some different false pastors that are preaching the very opposite of what we're saying right now. And it's not what we're saying. We're saying what the Word of God says, but they're going to say what they think and their opinion is. But this is this is too important. To just let you just fly by and just let it go. This is so important. This is your soul we're talking about. My soul, Adam's soul, what we're talking about. This is so important to bring these things out. And you need this foundation. Yeah. So guys, please stick around. Uh, don't click off. Just wait to the end. We're gonna bring up some things that are that are gonna be pretty shocking.
So what I want to talk about now is the whole psychological impact of calling yourself a sinner. You know, you've heard it from so many people. They say we're sinners saved by grace. They say that everybody's a sinner. Uh, all sins are the same. All these things in the scripture. But if you just think about the the psychological impact, not you know, I'm not talking about um, psychology and all that. I believe that the that the best antidepressant, like I heard you say one time, is the Holy Spirit, right? Is, is God's word. And he's able to bring oh, us yeah. that comfort and peace and joy that no medication can bring. So, so I'm not talking about psychology and all that. Uh, but I will say that if you just think about it from a sort of secular point of view, if you're, if you're always telling your child that they're just a good for nothing, you know, that they're maybe dumb or that they can't do anything right, you know, just like Christians say that we're all sinners, you know, none of us can obey God. Just think about what that would do, uh, to a child, if you were constantly telling your child, just beating this into their head day after day after day, because you hear this in churches pretty much every week that, that we're all sinners, that we, we can't obey God. And that's why Jesus had to come down and die on the cross because we can't obey him. Uh, you hear this every day, but just think about what that's doing. Just think about what that's doing. You're, so let's say somebody who was freed from their sin, who actually was born again, who repented of all their sin, sits in one of these churches today. And they're hearing this, you know, they don't know any better. They're just hearing this and the devil's trying to snatch the seed and trying to convince that person who actually is living holy. Uh, remember, Jesus said that if you make one of these little ones stumble, it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck or to have a millstone tied around your neck and be cast into the sea. And that's exactly what these preachers and teachers are doing. They're having these new converts that come in and they, and they sit under this teaching and they're telling them that they're basically just a good for nothing sinner. They can't do anything right. They can't obey Jesus. And what they're doing is, is it's like a little child. They're just beating down and just making them think. And of course, what are you going to do? A, a child that's told that they're good for nothing or they're dumb. Well, guess what? They're likely to start living that way. And they're going to say, well, I, I guess I'm just dumb. You know, I, I guess I'm just this. I guess I'm just good for nothing. I guess I just can't do anything mm. right. You know, and it, and it has an impact. It has a very strong impact on them. That's what these preachers are doing. And, and what are you going to do? You're going to start saying, if you're sitting under these pastors and teachers, you're going to start saying, well, I, I guess I am a sinner. You know, e even though you may be living for the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you're going to start to think it's that little lie, that little whisper of the devil that's going to get you to think, well, you know what? M maybe I am a sinner. And a lot of people, what they do is they take temptation, uh, which is not a sin, and they, they think that's a sin. They're told that that's a sin, essentially. And they start, uh, they start saying, well, I, I guess that thought that, that cropped up into my mind, even though I didn't act on it and I cast it down, I, I guess that was a sin. So, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess I'm a sinner, too. And, and they start living that out, right? It, it, it's, the seed, it's the devil that comes to snatch the seed, and then they start going back to their sin. And this is just a tragedy. I mean, it, it's just a tragedy. Just imagine if somebody was doing this to your child. Just think about it. If somebody was calling your child uh, worthless or stupid or, or anything else, you would be, you would have a righteous anger, right? But yet these people are doing this to these baby Christians. Um, but, but even, even if it's not, just think about, just think about the impact that this has on people who maybe aren't living holy. It, it's just reaffirming them, strengthening them in their sin. Uh, but listen, here, here's what the Bible says about to those who call uh, good, evil, and evil, good. It says, woe to those who call evil, good, and good, evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And in Proverbs 17, 15, uh, that was Isaiah 5, 20, but this is, uh, this is Proverbs 17, 15. It says, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike mm -hmm. are an abomination to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. An abomination. So, so these men, and who are preaching to people that uh, that let's say somebody who is living holy and their their heart is sold out for the Lord, they're telling them that they're a sinner. I mean, you hear this all the time when you try to talk to people and they come against us on YouTube and they say, "Oh, you know what? Well, you're a sinner too, and everybody sins." And they accuse you, right? Uh, just like the accuser of the brethren, the, the devil, right? They come against you and they try to convince you that you're a sinner too, even though again the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, but this is an abomination to the Lord. When you're accusing God's children who were actually doing what Jesus commanded them. Remember, uh, in Revelation, I believe it's 14, 12, it says that uh, the saints are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And do the, so mm -hmm. if you're telling somebody who's doing that, who's keeping the commandments of God, that they're a sinner, 
essentially, what are you doing? You're, te- you're, you're condemning the just. And God calls this an abomination. Just think about that. You're going to see in a few minutes when he, when uh, Brother uh, Adam plays uh, these different uh, false teachers, what's going on out there. But why not? And this is what we do. And, and this is what I want to encourage you. And we want to encourage you with. Uh, look at the scriptures in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So can you stop sinning? Should you stop sinning? Should you obey God? Don't say you can't do it because that's what they're telling you because they want you to believe that to keep you in your sin and keep you coming there so that they can think that they, they're going to try to put you through some sort of sanctification, which is not at all as such because they go 25 years and they're still not any better or, or even longer. But he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when Jesus said, go and sin no more, can I do that? My Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What about 2 Corinthians 2, 14? He called through Christ. He causes me to triumph over all things through Christ, to triumph, to have the victory over it. What do you mean you, you beat down with sin and you can't stop? What do you mean? What do you mean you can't do what Jesus said? What, what else did he say? Uh, Romans 8, 37. He says, he called, he, I am more, more than a conqueror through Christ. Can you conquer it? I'm more than a conqueror. Absolutely. To do that. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, thanks be to God, which causes, which, which gives me the victory. You have got the victory. You need to start believing what the word of God says instead of what these people are saying. Well, are you kidding me? You're going to believe what the people say? What these pre- preachers are saying who are not even qualified, most of them to even be a preacher? You need to wake up. Listen, the scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul gives a dire warning. He said, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears because they don't, they don't love the truth. So I'm not just blaming, blaming the preachers, Adam, but the people also, they, are, they want to be convinced that they're okay in their sin. If you read your Bible and you'll t- take your time to seek after God with all your heart, as he says in Jeremiah, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, 13, then you will find what he says here and what we're talking about here. May the Lord open your eyes to see this before it's too late. When Paul said, mm-hmm. wake up and quit <clears throat> sinning in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, he meant what he said. What do you mean wake up and quit sinning? I can't quit sinning. Yes, you can and it's Amen. a glorious life, and it's easy. First John chapter 5 says his commandments are not burdensome. Do what he says. Listen Amen. to the scripture. Luke 17, 10 says this. <clears throat> After you've done everything that the Lord commanded you, say that I'm an unprofitable servant. I'm only doing that which is my duty to do. Everything you commanded you? What do you mean? I, most people said, I can't do what he commanded me. He, why would he say that then? Why would he say, say After you've done. After you've done everything I commanded you to say you're an unprofitable servant, I'm only doing that which is my duty to say. Some people say, well, oh, you're just going to boast if you do everything. No, that's just our duty. We were made blameless. We were made upright. First, uh, uh, like Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, you were created upright. You're only going back to what you're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to do. And you can do that, and you must do that. Please exactly. take heed. Yeah, it, it reminds me of, uh, James also talks about how we have to lay aside all filthiness. That's what it says. All filthiness. See, guys, this this sounds like what we're preaching uh, is, is heresy or something foreign because this isn't preached in most Christian circles today. But this is this is just what the Bible says. Uh, James, right. for example, he says, lay aside all filthiness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. So that's what we're asking and pleading with you to do is to re- is to lay aside all filthiness. That's what it says. And receive with meekness, with humility. That's true humility is receiving these these scriptures. Okay, me and Don aren't up here just preaching our own thoughts and opinions. We're we're giving scripture after scripture after scripture, and and that's like uh, you know, brother Don. That's that's like when I first started watching your your videos. It was like ah, I mean, it was difficult. It was tough, but I knew that I had to humble myself and and receive it. Because that's what the good soul does. They, they hear the words mm, of Jesus. They the receive Lord. them and they accept them. Wow. They accept the word, which is able to save their souls. But uh, guys, l- let me just show you something. I don't know if it's going to show up or not, but we're going to try it. Um, let me just show you. This was a recent poll. 
Uh, okay, there we go. This was a recent poll that was taken from a, uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of the channel. It was a heretical channel. Uh, he's a false teacher. But he put up on his channel this question right here. Look at this, guys. The question is, mm. are believers just as wicked and sinful as unbelievers? So it's asking, are, are, are we just as bad off? Are we just as sinful as, let's say, an atheist down the street? And look at this. The majority of people, th this was just uh, captured today. The majority of people, it stands right now, 55% say yes. A, a, a person who is a, a true Christian, a believer, is mm. just as wicked and sinful as unbelievers. Do you, do you catch that? Most, and, and I assume that many of the people, if not most, of the people who respond to this poll are, are Christians who said this. And you know, I could understand if this was maybe atheist saying, that, yeah, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. But, but no, this was from a Christian, uh, Christian YouTuber's channel. And he, he asked his viewers this. So, so I assume that at least a good portion of them are Christians answering this. That, yeah, uh, believers are, are just as wicked and sinful as unbelievers. Uh, now, the let correct me, let me answer to should let me, be no. Let, let, uh, Adam, let's, let's change that around just a bit, if you don't mind, from where you've been. You started off talking about saints and sinners, uh, right? So here, let's just change the word believers to saints, because that's what believers are, right? They're saints. Are, are saints just as wicked and sinful as sinners? Mm. That's, that's what we talked about before. You know, are, are, are saints, they're not even sinners. They're, they're blameless. But they're placing it as a believer as if almost like James 2 talks about, you believe there's one God, you do well, but the devil also believes and trembles. This is not, you know, a, a true believer is a saint that actually lives the word of God. It's not somebody that just has some head knowledge of believe. Well, I believe in Jesus. No, it's much deeper than that. It's the, it's the word saint. It's the one that's living holy and righteous before the Lord. Because if it's just... Believing as what a lot of people think believing might be, in a, in a, in, as far as believing historically, he died and resurrected, then the devil himself would be saved because he certainly believed the same thing. But let me give you another scripture before I give it back to you in just a second. But th this is just, this just, it doesn't surprise me, but yet it, sh it should shock so many people because it's, it's just like, these are people, the ones that put this out, like you said, Adam, are people that are calling themselves believers themselves. And they want to say, well, you know, we're not any different than, than the rest of the world. We're, we're sinning just like they are, but yet we're going to go to heaven because we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Where in the world does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't. The Bible, the, the Scripture says the opposite. It says, says we, we, we both labor, whether present or absent, that we may be acceptable to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for those things that we've done in our body, whether good or bad. That's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Or that in every nation, that every nation that works righteousness, that fierce God that works righteousness, is accepted with him. You need to be accepted by Jesus, not him accepting you. you he doesn't have to measure up to you. You have to measure up to him. That's why the scripture says in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. But I want to give you one more scripture, and I'm going to turn it back to you, Adam. In, in, in the book of Titus, chapter 1, in verse 16, listen to this. It says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. They profess that they believe, but in works they deny him. In other words, in what they're doing, they're denying that they know him being abominable, disobedient. So they profess they know it, but they're disobedient. That's denying that you know the Lord. And under every mm. good work, reprobate. Every good work, reprobate. Listen, what's, what, what are you, what's happening in this society? It's horrible what's going on. The scripture says in, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Paul writes, and he said, you are our epistle. You're our Bible. You're our letter, written and read of every man, of every man. People, they're looking at these people that are calling themselves believers, Adam, and, and they're, they, they're looking at them and they're saying, this is Christianity? They're no different than, they, than we are. And they're, then they're fool, they even know, the heathen even knows. It says they're so foolish as to think they're going to heaven because they just accepted Jesus. 
but they live in that same wickedness? Are you better than the Jews, what Paul said in Romans 11, to, um, to, to take heed? The, behold, the goodness and severity of God, goodness to those who continue walking in the Lord, severity to those who don't. Why have you exactly. been listening to the twisting of those scriptures to, to your own destruction? Listen to what the yep. word of God says. Again, why do you say you're a Christian and don't do the things that Jesus said? My, Amen. He said, go and sin no more. Listen to what he said and do it. Be doers of the word, James 1.22 says, and not hearers only or else you're deceiving yourself. Quit deceiving yourself. Yep. Quit letting them deceive you and listen to what the words of Jesus said. Yeah, uh, th this was a huge turning point in my life when I I'd fallen into sin years back and I, this message just was was continually beat into me that we're all just sinners that basically essentially that we're that we're no different than sinners. Uh, the only difference is that we're covered under the blood and and God can't see our sin and all this. And this was just constantly being fed to me uh, under the under the teachers that I was sitting under. And this was a huge turning point when I just broke down with the Lord and, and I just you know, I wanted to be free from my sin. I, I really did. But I didn't know how because I'd been fed all this false doctrine. And and, and it just I came to a really low point in my life. And I just thought, what is the point in Christianity? I mean, I mean, honestly, if, if we're the same exact way as before we came to Christ, then what's the point? I mean, what, what's the point mm -hmm, in Jesus' mm -hmm, death on the cross? Mm -hmm. Just uh, just just so that That's we can right. keep on sinning, like like Paul said, uh, certainly not by no means. And this just really this really hit me. And I, and, and I almost, you know, in a way. I almost that was like a turning point for me because I could have fallen from the yeah. faith at that point because yeah. I was thinking, what's the point in all this? There's really no point. I might as well just go back to my sin. And then the Holy Spirit broke through and and told me and talked to me uh, that Thank I need God. to actually repent Thank and turn Lord. from my sin mm. and to not listen mm. to these these pastors who were telling me this that there's nothing that we can do and all that. Um, but uh, okay, let me let me pull this back up here. Hold on. Yeah, and those, those, um, and those people, those people are miserable, uh, Adam. That that are living in that, and they they think and they don't have. They say impossible for him to, them to have the peace. It's impossible to have the joy. The Bible says in Isaiah twenty six three that perfect peace will I give to him whose mind is stayed on me. They admittedly say their mind's not on the Lord. How can you have the peace then? That you can't. How can your heart and mind be kept in the Lord? All these things because you you're still seeking after the world and after your own thing. The problem is is you haven't fallen in love with Jesus. You you still love what you're doing more than you love Jesus when it really comes down to it. Yeah, and, and you have if a lot of follow, pastors. Yeah, yeah, you have a lot of pastors that are taking antidepressants and, and just getting up on stage. And, and I've heard them just saying, oh, you know, hey, I'm struggling with depression and anxiety and, and this and that. And it's like, and, and it's because their heart's not right before God. And and that's another thing I wanted to say was, uh, sorry, to, sorry to kind of interrupt you there, but um, that's no, another thing good. I wanted to say yeah. was that People with this whole poll, it just shows that people don't understand, A, the new birth. They don't understand that we were given mm -hmm. new hearts and that we, we've we been given new mm -hmm. desires and that we've been born again. And there, there of course, there should be a change that we, we shouldn't look exactly like the world. Uh, and in fact, like you pointed out in so many different scriptures, we're to be holy, set aside, set apart. That's what it means to be a saint. You're set apart, not not just positionally, but literally and in, in, in actuality, in reality, you're set apart. So yeah, go Amen. go ahead there. Amen. I no, put it, that in like there. you said, it, like you said in Second Corinthians five seventeen, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And a lot of people know that scripture, and, and they don't really realize what it's saying. He's a new creature. Old things are past. All that old, all that old way of living, they're past, and all things have become new. I want to give you one more scripture with this, if you don't mind, uh, guys. Yeah. In Ephesians chapter two, it really, really identifies a Christian from a non Christian. These are people that were non-Christian that Paul is talking about that become Christians. And I want to show you what happens when you become a Christian according to Scripture. I'm just going to read the Scripture for what it is right in the context of what it says so that you can get a clear understanding. Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And you, speaking to the, to the Ephesian church, and some of them are there, and you had to quickened or made alive who were dead in your sins and in your trespasses. The scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that the woman that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. So if you're living in your pleasure and your life and what you want, you're dead while you live. In the first chapter here, he says, and you, you have to be quickened. What, what were they before? He says, 
you were dead in your sins. You can't be alive in sin. You were dead in your sin. But he made you alive. Death, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. You're dead when you're living in that. But look what he says. Where in time past, you walked according to the course of the world. You walked just like the rest of the world. And these people, that Adam and are saying they're Christians, they're saying they're saints, and they walk in the course of the world and still doing those things, still sinning. They haven't been redeemed. They haven't been illuminated. They haven't been quickened. That's the way it says. You were walking according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? The devil. But my Bible tells me in John chapter 6, my sheep hear my voice. And a stranger's voice they will not follow. This one's following the voice of the devil. It says they're walking according to the prince of the power of the world, the devil. That's why it says in 1 John 3, 8, it says if you sin, you have the devil. So these people that want to claim to be saints, look what it says. We'll, we'll go to a preceding verse there, 1 John 3, 7. It says this. The one, don't be deceived. Only the one who does righteousness is righteous, even as Christ is righteous. If you claim and you're righteous and you're not doing righteousness, you're not righteous. Just like it says in Proverbs eleven six. it says the righteousness of the righteous shall deliver him. But look, let's go further. It says back to chapter two, it says, according to the prince of the world, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So if you're disobedient, you're claiming to be a saint, you're claiming to be a Christian, and you're disobedient, guess what? The devil's working through you. I didn't say it. The spirit right here, it says, the prince of the power of the air is working in those that are disobedient. And he said, Nate, and not only that, he's saying you were like this. Not that you mm. are like this. And look what he says, among whom, verse 3, he says, among whom also we all had our way of living, our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, sinning. What is the lust of the flesh? First John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, right there. The lust of the spirit, the, yeah. the lust, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So he says, "You were fulfilling the desires of the flesh." What is that? Sin. That's what fulfilling the desires of the flesh is. You were doing that. You see the difference in a sinner and a saint is explained clearly right there. You were that, but now your eyes have been opened. You've been uh, you you've been quickened. You've been made alive. That, uh, you're not being ruled by the prince of the power of the air. You're not following the course of the world. Your conversation, the way you live is totally different. You're not walking after the flesh anymore, but you're walking after the spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, let me just, let me just go through a few scriptures here on, on what Paul says and what the Bible says. The Bible says that we were sinners. Okay. This is, this is very, very clear throughout scripture. Romans 5, 8, listen to this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. You see that? While we were still sinners. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you were something, that means that you're not that anymore. So, so it just boggles my mind how, how Christians can still call themselves sinners when Paul says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What was that, okay? script, what was then, that scripture again? I want to make sure they get that one. Oh, Adam, what was that uh, scripture? Yeah, yeah. Romans 5, 8. And, and there's, a, there's a couple others here as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. He goes through this list of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. sinners, who, people who are doing unrighteous things like idolatry, fornicating, adulterers, homosexuals, you know, those things. And like in Revelation, it says uh, that the righteous will inherit all things, but uh, liars and idolaters and all those, their portion will be the second death. Uh, but it says, listen to this. He says, and such were some of you. Meaning that you're that you're not sinning anymore. That you're not doing those things mm -hmm, you used mm -hmm. to, but you're not anymore. Uh, Ephesians two one through two, like you talked about uh, in Ephesians, he made alive who were mm -hmm. were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. See, the, this is mm -hmm, past tense, mm -hmm. meaning that you don't do these things anymore. Uh, and then in First Peter four one through five, he says, therefore, mm -hmm. since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. They'll tell you you can't cease from sin. But again, we're just reading from scripture. So in humility and meekness, receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, guys. He said, Peter says he has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. 
for we have spent enough of our, our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked. Listen to this. Again, past tense. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, listen to this. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood mm-hmm. of dissipation, mm-hmm. speaking evil of you. They mm-hmm. will give an account to him who is ready to judge yep. living and the dead. Yeah. So, so they, they think it's strange that you don't do these things anymore. So, so this whole poll that says that, that you look exactly the same, you're just as wicked and sinful as unbelievers, as atheists, uh, Muslims, you know, anybody else, you're just as wicked. Think about that. He's saying that, no, these unbelievers think it's strange because why? Because you're not doing the same things that they're doing anymore. Right. You've stopped, right. You stopped doing them. You have ceased from sin, like he says. I want to say something uh, about what you said in 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, if, if I can, Adam. Um, a lot of people, you know, when you talked about ceasing from sin, it says to arm yourselves with the same mind as Christ, for he that has suffered in flesh has ceased from sin. Cease means stopped, of course. Um, a lot of people say, well, that's Christ. And we want to clarify that Christ never ceased from sin because he never started sinning. So it's impossible for, for it to be talking about Christ. It's talking about you. And I've never heard anyone in all my time of, 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 of you know, I go out street preaching. We go out talking to many, many people and I'll bring that scripture up. And no one has ever been able to refute that scripture. They do it in a, a they try to make it say something different. What is it? But in the context and what it's saying is no way around it. He yeah, stopped, and it goes on to say that you're no longer you. doing these things. Yeah. For the rest of your life, that's for the rest strange. of your life. And that's so beautiful. That's that's a one-time repentance, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Praise Amen. God. There's one thing that's very important that we talk about before we close. That's your soul. The scripture says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? In other words, why do you say you're Christian and you don't do what Jesus said to do. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, go and sin no more. He said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He said to follow him as that example. If you listen to today's message, and it convicted you, and it showed you error in your life, and maybe even one of these passages you listen to, maybe your pastor saying the same thing, I want to talk to you a moment. You need to come to that place, like it says in Hebrews 5, 9. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him. Listen to that. It doesn't say that he's the author of eternal salvation to all that disobey him, but to those who obey him. Obedience is necessary for your salvation, so there must be repentance. Please listen. You have conviction on your heart. You have been sinning. And you've been thinking you're a Christian. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, those that are Christ have, past tense, crucified, put to death, the passions and the desires of the flesh. What you need to do, and I'm pleading with you to do it. Go somewhere in your closet or alone, kneel down before God, and confess your sins to him and commit to, to forsake them. The Bible says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts he will give you, he will direct your thoughts. So commit your ways to the Lord. He said, if you'll confess and forsake your sin, he'll show you mercy. So confess them and ask him to forgive you for everything you've ever done and commit to him never to sin again. You'll find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. It says, a godly sorrow, a brokenness, a contrite spirit. I don't care what you've done. The Lord will forgive you for all of it. If you come to him with a broken and contrite spirit, that's called godly sorrow, where you're really sorry for your sin. And you confess it to him. And then you, could, you forsake it, which is repentance. Repentance means a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. Repentance is where you turn from your sin and you turn to righteousness. Again, the Bible says in Ezekiel 3.21 to warn the righteous that the righteous don't sin. So when you confess and you forsake it, that's called repentance. And then you receive salvation, which is what I want for all of you. But it says one other thing after that. It says godly sorrow leads to repentance, repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. 
That means you don't go back to sin ever again. Fall in love with Jesus. Commit your ways to the Lord and all your works. And walk with him. And never go back. I love you guys. If you need fellowship, we have fellowship at our services three times a week. Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central Time. Wednesday at 7 and prayer meeting at 7 on Fridays. You're welcome. We do that not because we want your money or anything else. We want to help you. We don't want to leave you just out there with the word and you be by yourself. We want you to come and be with us and get that fellowship and encouragement. You can find that at Only One Truth on YouTube. God bless you and also abide in the word. God bless you and have a great day. Abide in the word dot com